Um, we now move on to the next part of our program, a part which I'm very excited about. In the Pirkei Avos, Jewish Ethics, it says, who is wise? Who is a wise person? One who studies from everyone. Halom and Nikol Adam, one who could learn from everyone. And the truth is that, that really in this room, everyone here has what to teach all of us, and everyone can get up and share words of inspiration and wisdom. I don't think it's going to work, though, um, to have everyone talk. You know, they say about an event which had a lot of speakers, and finally someone gets up and is towards the end, and, and there's really no one left except for one person. So he gets up and he gives a speech for that one person. And then he says to him afterwards, he says, I just want to thank you for staying. He says, no, 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 I'm the next speaker. So, <laughs> so we, uh, we do have four, uh, four speakers. I'd like to say perhaps, you know, we look for treasures sometimes outside and other places, but we really have treasures within our community. And I think the four speakers we have today are treasures. Um, most certainly our first speaker, who's a very hush of a person, uh, Mr. Manny Middleman, who is going to share with us from his experiences as a survivor. Um, Mr. Middleman, who is now 90 years old, Kenai Nahara, may live and be well, strong for many, many more years, and um, born in Czechoslovakia, spent three years in Auschwitz, he'll tell us more about that, has been here and is now the Gabai at uh, Young Israel of Oak Park. I've had the pleasure of studying with uh, Mr. Middleman, and we also have the pleasure of having Jonathan and Sarah, his uh, grandchildren, as part of our community. So, Mr. Middleman, please. I'm fine, I'm fine. Watch your phone. Can I put it on? <clears throat> uh, after, uh, after the rabbi's <laughs> nice introduction, I do not have to tell you who I am, but I'm going to go down right away to the facts. Um, I read an article in the paper several weeks ago, really several months ago, that there are 180,000 Holocaust survivors in Israel. And they're dying at the rate of 10,000 a month. That was six months ago. So we are a disappearing act in this world, but as long as we are here, I love to share with people experiences. Uh, the first experience I'll tell you, in 1942, I was 17 years old. I was deported to Lublin Maidanek on Pesach. I spent my first Seder night in the train, in the cattle train. And on Shavuos, which was seven weeks later, we landed in Birkenau. <laughs> and if I use the word hell in this world, it does not describe even enough what Birkenau was in 1942. But things were so bad, I had two brothers there and a sister. And we tried to cleave together. Birkenau, unlike Auschwitz, had no flowing water. And conditions were beyond belief. There were days where my tongue and other people's tongues were cleaving to your palate because of dryness, and you couldn't get a drop of water. At one point, it came, like I told you, I'm 17 years old. I couldn't take it anymore. Around the camp, there was a fence that was charged with 12,000 volt of electricity. And I wasn't the only one who got sick and tired of living at that point. People would continuously run purposely to the fence, and they were instantly killed. It was a way out from your sorrows, from your suffering. And at one point, I reached that level. I didn't tell my brothers a word. 
but I decided today I'm going and I'm going to go to the wires because I cannot take it anymore. I'm sorry, excuse me. There was a little embankment in order to get to the wires. You have to go a little bit down and then you were able to touch the wires and get rid of your life in a sense. And I was just about approaching that embankment to go down. Like I told you, I was 17 years old. Things came back to my mind. And when I was in Haider, I was a little child. My Rebbe told me that anybody who takes his life will never have a part in the world to come. And for some reason, this came back in my memory just a second before I was going to go down to the wires. And I changed my mind. I didn't go. I said, I'm going to lose I'm going to lose the world to come. I'm not going. To come. I'm not going. Many years later, I would say 30, 40 years later, I remember that incident and I found a posuk in Tehillim that describes this perfectly. David HaMelech, <coughs> King David, says, Lulei Soroskul Shashuoi, where it not that the Torah came you to help, us ovarity on you, then I would have been lost in my affliction. And I said to myself, Rabbi Shalom, how true is that posuk? I would be standing in front of you if I wouldn't have remembered the words from my rabbi who told me anybody who takes his life loses the world to come. And that's what it saved me why I am here capable to speak to you. In 1944, when conditions were a little better, I happened to be working at that time in the camp that we called prisoners, tagged the camp, Canada. And the reason why we called it Canada is because when the Hungarian Jews were arriving in 1944, all their suitcases and whatever they had were taken away from them, and they were brought into this camp where men and women were assorting it, and the Germans then took it to wherever they had to take it. In 1944, Rosh Hashanah, I decided, I want to also underscore to you, that most of the people by now not only they lost in faith in God, they were so much suffering of Torahs, they almost forgot that there is such a thing as God. He came before Rosh Hashanah, and I don't have to tell you, there were plenty Jewish people, mostly Jewish people. I organized a minion for Rosh Hashanah morning davening. I don't know if you visualize what it took to get a few guys to come. Even in this camp, we even had a talus that we found in the packages from the Hungarian Jews. And we gathered together in an empty barrack. We put down in all four corners guards to watch out if an assessment doesn't come. And we made inside the minion. And I remember as I'm standing right now here. I was davening for the Omid because when I was at home yet, 10, 11, 12, I used to be a Meshorer by the Chazan. I used to sing in a choir by the cantor, so I'm, I was familiar very much with the Shashurim Kippur davening. <coughs> we are the minion, the davening. Our guards are watching outside 
and I'm saying the loud Shemonaster of Musa, all of a sudden, the door, the doors being torn open, an assessment, his name was Unterschar Führerbunch, walks in with a pistol in the hand, shoots above my head, and starts yelling, what are you guys doing here? You think this is a hater? Of course, we all dispersed as quick as we could. And uh, needless to say that we went almost to guy, get the guys who were supposed to be watching and almost killed them. But I want to bring out to you uh, something, an unbelievable fact. This assessment, this Unterschaf Ferrovunch, was not further away from me than this door. He didn't miss of an accident because he missed on purpose. And the reason I want to also tell you, I still have some minutes in a way, I'll tell you why he missed. I have now some literature that I got from the internet. This assessment, Unterschaf Ferrovunch, fell in love with a Jewish girl that came from Slovakia. I can even tell you the name. Her name was Hindu Helena Citron. And uh, I discussed this a million times. There's a Mrs. Abrams here in town. Mrs. Hill Abrams, she's a first cousin to that girl. This assessment fell in love with that girl. Of course, it was Auschwitz. They couldn't go out to bars or something. But everybody knew that they have a thing going. I'm not accusing of anything. I'm just mentioning to you something. And one day, this Hindu Citron's sister arrived in Birkenau with two little kids. And she found out. So she went to the Sutta Shafir Bunch and told them, you have to save my sister. And everybody knew that if you came to Auschwitz, with little children, that was the end of you. So this Untersha fear of Wunsch, I feel mentioning it in Shul because he saved this Hindu sister's life. He went over to the place where they made the selection, took away the two children from the mother, gave it to another woman who had children, and he saved her. Many years, after that, they, after they were liberated, they moved to Israel. And in Israel, there was a club of guys, friends of mine, both girls and, and boys, who used to meet every two weeks and have a meeting discussing all the happenings, what happens in Auschwitz. And it became to them a habit. This Hindu Citron belonged to that group. One day, this Unterschaf here of Wunsch that I mentioned to you before, the assessment was caught by the Germans and they put him in jail and he's going to have a court day for abusing power and doing wrong things to the people in the camps. So his wife flew into Israel in begging this Hindu citron she should come as a witness and speak on behalf of her husband. So the guys who used to get together every two weeks had a meeting and they voted that she should not go because he did a lot of bad things. Just because he saved one life, they think that she should not go. Of course, Hindu didn't listen and she flew to Germany and the guy got off. I have the papers now at home. Somebody brought it to me from, from, from the computer with a picture of the assessment, with a picture of this Hindu Citron. Years later in, 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 in Eretz Yisrael, they had these beautiful magazines. I was once, I probably still have it at home, reading this whole story in the Israeli press. The whole country saw pictures and pictures of the whole happenings, telling them what happened with this assessment and, 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 and how she saved his life. She was 
Even the sister was pictured there too, the one whose life she saved. All right, I guess everybody, this is my time up, no? Oh, that was for questions and answers. Chano. He's talking about that. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, that's fine. Question. And if you do, maybe come, <coughs> come up and take the microphone. Are you in the story? No, 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 I'm at the end of the story. Oh. I mean... <laughs> Listen, I can go out to the story for another two hours. The rabbi told me I have 10 minutes, so I took 12 minutes. So, and, uh, <clears throat> so what happened to the guy that, 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 that what? Okay, his question. This is the guy, this is the guy that I described. What happened to him in the end? Where is he? Where is he? I don't know if he's still alive, he's in Germany. That was this Unterschafir Wunsch. He's the one who shot, and I, I am telling you, the deep in my mind, deep in my mind, I believe that the reason why the guy didn't kill me is because he was friendly with this Hindu Citron, and this Hindu Citron knew me, and he knew that I know her, and he was afraid that he will lack, not being looked very favorable in her eye if he kills a Jew because he damned her Shishon. It's like the rabbi said before, this is up in heaven, we don't know. Yes. Okay. It's kind of hard for me. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> um, I did visit Auschwitz and Birkenau. Uh, two years ago, and uh, tried to put myself in that place, and it's hard for me to even imagine the times going on there, and the horror, even after you know, hearing people speak and visiting a couple of uh, Holocaust memorials, and to understand the horrors that went on there, and from the other side as well, I'm wondering how, if a person of such great conscience, how could, I mean, he not run away? If a man had consciences like this German SS man, there were deserters. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to understand. My answer to that would be that when a person is in love, he's blinded. He really was a Russia. He really was an anti-Semite like the rest of the Germans were. I'm not trying to put him in a favor of things, but because he was blindly in love with this girl, he didn't want to cause something that will cause a rift between the two of them. You know, when you are in love, you don't think straight. I'm, I'm trying to tell you that I'm convinced that he would have not be ashamed. He was too close to me not to be able to shoot me to die. And he did not do it because out of fear what his girlfriend is going to say. Both Holocaust survivors, and I'm just wondering, did you ever go back to uh, visit the camps of the war? And no. also, um, what's your feeling about the industry that they've made of the Holocaust in Poland today? Excuse me, of the Holocaust over there now. And okay, I have never gone back to any of these camps because in the first 30 years after. I was liberated. I suffered tremendously. I used to be, won't be, wouldn't be able to sleep in the night because of horror dreams. I used to wake up, my wife used to wake me up sometimes in the night because every night another assessment was shooting and killing me. And it took me over 30 years to get this out of my system. And I want to tell you, I made the statements recently to somebody, which is maybe hard to understand, 
but he says in Kohelas that hatred kills the hater, not the hated. Okay? And I decided after many, many years, and uh, like I said, 35 years after the Holocaust, up until now, I was speaking publicly to people, to groups. I was in Los Angeles in a Baziaco school. I spoke there for 200 people, 200 girls in a school, and uh, for two and a half hours. I have no problem today speaking. Sometimes I break down, that's true, because we have emotions, we become emotional. But I want to tell you one thing. There came a point when I decided in my own mind that I have to take that hatred out of my system. Because when I came home from the camps and I found a woman living in my house who threw my aunt and her two children out of the place, I went in the kitchen there, I took a knife, and I told her who I was, and she ran off. But I'm telling you right now that when I came back from the camps, I could have taken a knife and slice someone who hurt me like a salami. But Baruch Hashem, I'm thankful to God that now, since a few years, if I find a guy who was the worst to me, who, he said, this guy killed your parents, I wouldn't be able as much as to spit on him. Because thank God the hatred is from me out because the hatred was killing me, not that Nazi. They're all gone. So I decided from that on, no more such a thing as hatred. I tell the story, I still don't go back to the old country or to Auschwitz because I've seen enough of it, so there's no reason for me to go back. I had other people who did go back, and then for six months they couldn't sleep. So, what do I have to go, relive all that stuff? One time is enough. 